Today is our babka baking class with Melissa Weller and our special guest, Carolina Santos Neves. Hello, Carolina. Hi, Melissa. How are you? Hi, Carrie. We are so lucky to have these two pros with us. I wore my culinary goddess sweatshirt just in honor of the two of you because I'm so excited. Melissa is going to bake her beautiful chocolate babka from her brand new cookbook, A Good Bake. Carolina, I think you have the cookbook right there if you want to show the cookbook for one second. Yes. We will be talking a lot about this gorgeous book. Um, Melissa, obviously you're here because you know Melissa and you want to learn something from this incredible baker. But Melissa really is a baker's baker. Um, she has just had a remarkable career that she and Carolina are going to talk about a little bit. Um, I would like to thank our sponsor for today's demo first, Carrie Gold. I've always got Carrie Gold in my fridge and not just because my name is Carrie. Um, I love this product and they uh, have been a wonderful supporter of all of our holiday baking extravaganza programming. They make beautiful Irish grass fed butter and dairy. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about it because Melissa does use Carrie Gold. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, Carolina, let's talk about you before I hand the reins over to you. Oh my goodness. So Carolina is the executive chef at American Bar in New York City's West Village. Um, she is also co-founder of an organization called Breaking Bread. Um, Carolina, can you tell us a little bit about Breaking Bread before we, before you start talking to Melissa? Yeah, I'm one of five co-founders, but it's basically a nonprofit based out of New York that really focuses on um, showing up for those who are food insecure. So we work with community gardens. We work with restaurants and providing, um, whether it's a CSA box or a meal for um, for those who, who need nourishment. So, yeah. So for those those who are watching who would like to support Breaking Bread, how can they help? Um, you can follow us on Instagram at breakingbread.nyc. Uh, also, if you Google GoFundMe and Breaking Bread, um, you know, we're trying to raise funds. Um, happy to share anything uh, anymore, DM me, <laughs> email me. Um, and we're also doing a virtual bake sale. Um, well, when is that? Um, it's working with a couple um, bakers and chefs throughout New York. Uh, it's going on until I believe the third, I want to say the 28th or the 31st of January. Uh, okay. Basically it's a virtual bake sale um, and proceeds go to um, raising funds so that we can continue to provide um, this sort of offering and service. Um, but yeah. Well, that's amazing. Well, we'll help spread the word. Uh, there's you. nothing more we love than getting behind a good cause. Thank you. So so thank much. you for all the work that you and your co-founders are doing. Thank on you. That. Um, before we start, let me tell everybody a little bit about Melissa. Melissa, I have to look at my cheat sheet because you have worked at so many amazing places over the years, many of which have been my favorites. I mean, I'm a native New Yorker and you've just worked at the best of the best in the city. Um, you've worked at Babo, Sullivan Street Bakery, uh, High Street on Hudson, Per Se, Bouchon Bakery, Roberta's, Sedell's, um, and you were head baker at Walnut Street Cafe in Philadelphia. I mean, just a remarkable resume. And uh, again, we're thrilled that you're here. So without further ado, thank you to everyone who's tuning in. Thank you again to Carrie Gold and Carolina. I'll hand it over to you. So excited to be here. <laughs> I have to start off by saying this is a dream because I think I've told you this a thousand times, but I remember the first time I had one of your croissants and I was like, I think I had eaten a whole meal before and was like, no, no, no I don't want any. And I took one bite. I'm pretty sure I didn't even share uh, with two people that I was with. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm so blown away by everything that, that you do. Um, so what an honor. Yeah, thank you. No, thank uh, you. How are you this morning? I'm okay. I've been yeah. baking. I know. <laughs> I, at, I was at Gertie at six in the morning, baking bagels and pastries and just helping everything get set up and going. And then I came back here to um, get ready for the, my apartment, my home, to get ready for the babka class. Well, I want to talk about your cookbook, but while you're on the topic of Gertie's, Spot in Williamsburg, tell us a little bit more about what's going on there. I had the good fortune of stopping by and, and stocking up on not only Bobka, but like all your baked goods. But, but well, I mean, I think, I think for me, like what's going on is that the restaurant and bakery that I was at in the West Village closed because of COVID. And then 
And then for the over the summer, I was like, well, you know, I don't know what 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 I'm going to do. I sort of thought we'd get back to normal. And then when fall came, I said, okay, well, I, I need something to do. And just sort of very luck as luck would have it that Gertie, which is in my neighborhood, I live in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and so Gertie um, needed somebody to consult, and I I very happily volunteered to consult to make babka and different pastries. Gertie is a, a New York delicatessen style, modern, like diner, restaurant, cafe, and I'm excited to be there and make my pastries there. I mean, yesterday I went and you were sold out of your bagels in like five seconds. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's related. No, I think it's really related to the pandemic and the neighborhood and people just craving something and craving this need to get out and, yeah. and buy something and get out of their apartments. I, I really believe that. Yeah. And your cookbook that, I yeah. mean, it's, I have it right here in front of me. I have my notes on your babka recipe. I mean, it's, I, I definitely want to talk about it more towards the end. Cause I know I'm sure you want to, I'm sure everyone's like, let's start baking. Like I want to eat this already. I like um, that you have notes on the babka recipe. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, but yeah, but let's, why don't we get started? I know yeah. that you have um, sort of prepped so, a few things um, ahead yeah. of time. Um, so, so you speak to that. Yeah. So we have, we have about 40 minutes to go over how to make babka. Yeah. And it's a pretty, it's in my book and I have my book in front of me because I, you know, I, I've made babka for the last five to seven years and I, I tend to vary it and I have different versions of it in Excel on my laptop. And I really wanted to make sure that I was talking from the book. Um, and the vodka recipe is pretty big and it's a big part of, of one of the chapters. And then I go on to use the dough and laminate the dough. And for those of you who don't know what lamination is, it's when you fold, it's like when you're making croissant dough, it's, it's dough and butter layers folded together. And so I use the babka dough, the master dough recipe to make a lot of different things in my cookbook. And the babka takes time, yeah. but we have 40 minutes. So I really, I'm excited to show you, I think we're gonna talk about some of the steps and then we're going to demonstrate I think the things that are trickier that you really need to see on video to really like to grasp a little bit better. I'm a really visual person and videos have been a lifesaver for me in the last few years in terms of learning how to make things. And and your babka recipe is, it's a, it's a bit so, different. We'd love you to talk so, about that. Yeah, so that my babka, so I, I'm a career changer and I started working in the restaurant industry in my, my mid thirties, pretty much. And I started working at Bobo and that was about 15 years ago. Um, and I started working to, I, I wanted to open a restaurant that was bagel centric and that became Sedell's. And I, I spent two years on the opening of Sedell's just doing R and D. That was back in 2013. And one of the things that I really wanted to make was babka. And back in 2013, there really wasn't this big, crazy babka like trend happening. And so I decided to go to Ross and Daughters and get green oh, um, yeah. bakery babka. And I cut it in half and I'm like, wow, look at all those, look at all those swirls. I want to be able to replicate that. And I just sort of st started with a standard enriched dough which for me as a baker, that means it's a, it's a yeasted dough and it has some kind of fat added to it. So babka dough has eggs added to it, which has have fat in them. And it has butter added to it. And so, and milk also has fat. So it has all of those things in the dough. And so that's considered an enriched dough. So you wanna start with something like that. It's sort of like a brioche. And okay. so I started with that as my base recipe. And then I started tinkering with different different fillings and different ways to add the fillings into it. And it really became this craze um, when I opened Sedell's. And my babka is, um, it, it, babka comes, it's, it's a Jewish bakery cake, essentially. Babka means cake. It's a yeasted cake. It's like a kugelhoff, if you're familiar with kugelhoff in France. Mm -hmm. um, and it's yeasted and it's supposed to be a little, little bit bready. So this is like a bready babka, very traditional babka. Yeah. Um, with traditional, in my book, there are other traditional fillings like cinnamon, but right. everyone loves chocolate. So I wanted to start with chocolate today, but I thought it was interesting when I, I had a dinner at um, Zahab in Philadelphia and with a 
uh, Michael Solomonoff, and I brought him, he's the owner and founder of, of uh, Zahav, and I brought him my babka, this chocolate babka, and we started talking about it, and he's like, well, you know, bread, bread bakeries from Israel, and it tends to be more Sephardic, and so in, in the Middle East, they preserve everything because of the heat with simple syrup. And so it uh, made a lot of sense to me. My my babka is more Eastern European in style, more New York. It's really more New York. Yeah. And then you have this this beautiful laminated babka, which I think is also in the Jerusalem cookbook okay. um, as a crans cake okay. um, that's a laminated babka. So I wanted to, um, if you will, I wanted to start by just talking. I'm not going to demonstrate mixing the dough um, yeah. because I think you have the recipe. But if you have any questions, I can hand happy to answer questions about mixing the dough um but can a little bit about mixing the dough and some of the pitfalls to avoid and one of the things that stands out to me with my recipe is that the butter needs to be super soft or you end up with chunks of butter so you're basically making a dough that's like brioche you're putting milk and eggs and egg yolks in the bottom of your mixer bowl mm -hmm. and then you're adding flour and sugar and salt and yeast and then you're you're kneading the dough and once the dough is kneaded, then you're adding the butter to it. But this is such a moist, wet dough, it's sticky, it's messy, that if your butter is not soft enough, it will break up. It will, it will end up being in chunks in your dough. So at, at any kind of any bakery, because I've made it at several bakeries now, the, the trick is you almost want greasy butter. I don't want to say greasy butter, but it really has to be really that soft um, for it not to end up in chunks. Do you have an estimate of go like ahead. how long you think butter should be out? I'm just gonna go ahead and ask that. Um, more than more than 30 minutes, probably overnight is usually what I do. Okay. So usually in a, in my bakery, I'll have the the bakers scale out the butter the day before, right before they leave. It sits out overnight, it's covered, and then the next day it's soft, and then that's what we use. Okay. So. But I would say in the summertime, maybe it's an hour or two. It really depends on how warm your 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 room is, but it should be really like malleable, really okay. soft. Great. Um, and then the the dough the dough ferments. So after you do, you're done mixing the dough, you let it sit out at room temperature, and it ferments, and it it grows a little bit in volume, and then after an hour you're going to divide it into because this makes two babkas so each babka make is 500 grams so you divide the the dough in half you get about 500 grams and then you're going to refrigerate the dough until it is cold enough to handle and in the book i was just reading the book i'm like what does the book say because i I always plan everything out over days because I, I had just have so much going on and I have so many different recipes that I'm working on that I really sort of like separated by day. Um, and so I, I usually put the fermented babka in the refrigerator overnight, but my book, we were trying to be very mindful of how does a home baker bake. And so we said, Hey, they probably want to make it in just one day. So two hours would be sort of the minimum to get the babka dough cold enough to be able to roll it out. How long do you leave the dough out uh, if it's refrigerated overnight? I usually don't, but I have it out right now. And so I'm like, I really want to get going because I can feel it's almost too, it, this is a little too soft and it's been out for about like maybe 20 minutes. Keep going, keep okay. going. <laughs> I'm going to roll out my dough as you, Look at the question. Okay, perfect. And I'm using, a, I'm really using a lot of flour, by the way, and my dough is really cold. Um, one of the questions is, can you cut this recipe in half? Like, can I, like? Yeah, if you just want to make 500 grams, one babka loaf, you can absolutely cut it in half. Great. And then, um, can you make the dough by hand? What if someone doesn't have a stand mixer? Yes, you can make the dough by hand. I never worry about, I think the worry is that, oh, I have to make gluten in my dough and I need my a mixer to do it, but you absolutely don't. You can make anything by hand. You're just, you're going to have to use a lot of arm power, but you can, you can totally make it by hand. Right. I, over the summer, I was really curious about that. I had a, I had an assistant and she didn't have a mixer and we made bagels by hand. And I was really skeptical that it would work, but it, it actually did. So yes, you can make it by hand. Cool. Uh, 
And I believe you can freeze the dough, the dough ahead of time, though, no? for later use. Freeze what? Uh, freeze the dough. I think yes, I was you can freeze the dough ahead of time. When I freeze anything, I basically, when I'm ready to do something with it the night before, I'll put it into my refrigerator and let it thaw overnight in the refrigerator. Right. Um, I like this question. The one is, you know, you use chocolate cookies for the filling. Uh, yeah. You know, is this typical and why not use chocolate paste or chocolate chips? I think I like the chocolate cookies because there's some flour in them and they are absorbing some of the liquid from the fat from the melted chocolate and the butter. So uh, the idea of the cookies is that it's absorbing liquid a little bit. Okay, great. All right. So you've rolled, you're rolling out the dough. Okay, I have the dough rolled out. And then at this oh, point, what I would do is I'll put it, I'll roll it over my rolling pin like that. And it's sticking a little to my counter, but I have a sheet pan with, and there's a piece of parchment here. And then I'm going to dust the sheet pan. And then I'm just going to, it's going to overlap a little bit and hang over. And that's okay. You can just sort of fold it in like that. And then I'm going to refrigerate this. Okay. I would keep going, but I can tell that this is really soft. If I try to fill it right now and it's not really, and you could tell I did this really fast and anybody who's at home generally doesn't roll it out as fast as I do. And so when you're rolling it out more slowly, it warms up and the friction of the rolling pin and the heat from your hands warms it up. So the best thing you can do at this point is refrigerate it. Sometimes at the bakery, I'll refrigerate this for like overnight. Okay. Like we really break it out into steps. Like it has commercial yeast in it. It's not going to go bad. Just take your time, make sure it's really cold before you do anything else. Otherwise I've countless times it's stuck to the surface when I've gone to roll it up after I put the filling in, in it, and then it just creates a mess. So I'm going to, I'm going to run to my, not run. I'm going to go to my refrigerator out of the camera view and I'll be back in like 10 seconds. If you ever use Nutella, could one use Oreos? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like Nutella is, I Nutella is, you can try almost any filling in the babka dough and it's probably going to be successful. I don't know about the cream part of the Oreo, but I don't think it's not going to do anything. Yeah. I I used, there's a recipe in the book for a, like, like ricotta cream cheese and cranberries. And I've used that on my babka. And I thought that that was really interesting because the actual cheese filling absorbs into the dough. It actually makes a really, it's probably my favorite babka because it makes it really moist. Yeah. Um, but you can definitely use those things in your babka filling. And then the size of the dough, I mean, it's basically the sheet tray or the cookie or the baking tray. The size of the dough is 16 inch square. And okay. so a sheet tray is about 12 inches wide, 12 by 16. So you're going to have to fold it over like I did to get it to fit. Otherwise it will overhang. So I just fold it in a little bit and then I stick it in my refrigerator and I'll, I'll unfold it when I come back to do the filling. Okay. All right. So my filling, my filling is, I don't have the book or the recipe in front of me, but I know in my head what the ingredients are, just not the quantities. I can help, you. I can help you. Chocolate, it's, usually, it's chocolate. Yep. And also butter and yep. honey and cookie crumbs, right? Exactly. And so I usually like to make, I usually like to make my own cookie crumbs. And so I usually make chocolate shortbread cookies um, and I made some, I made some the other day. And what I do is I'll process these in my food processor. So they're cookie crumbs. Okay. Um, at the bakery, I, we always try to like economize our work at the bakery. And so I don't even roll the cookie dough out at the bakery. I just crumble it onto a sheet pan and bake it because it's just going in the food processor. Why waste the time of rolling it out? Unless you want to eat the cookies why waste the time of rolling it out? So those are the main ingredients in the babka. And then the idea is that you're melting the chocolate and the butter together, and then you're gonna whisk in the honey and the cookie crumbs. And then the, the key for me is the consistency of the filling when you're spreading it, because you have to spread it really thinly 
over a really thin piece of dough. And if it's too cold, it will seize, it, it's too cold, you can't spread it and it will cause the dough to like sort of tear and you won't, you won't be able to spread it. But if it's too liquidy, it actually means it's too warm and it causes the dough to be a little bit too, it warms up the dough and then, then you have warm dough on your surface and then it also sticks to your surface. So I made this, I made this vodka filling um, yesterday actually, mm -hmm. and it is a little too thick right now. I, 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 I use my microwave at home quite a bit to warm things up so I get them to the right consistency. And in the book, in the recipe, you make the filling and then you're letting it cool down a little bit. But now this is, we've been talking, this cooled down a little bit too much. So I'm gonna quickly like put it in my microwave for about 20 seconds. Okay, so right now it's like a frosting. Textbook. It's a little bit like frosting, yeah. I spilled some. But you want it to be <laughs> like bit. frosting, but it should be a little bit like thinner, um, okay. almost like really like 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 a really moist buttercream that you're just easily spreading on top of a cake. Um, and, so um, I'm gonna get some honey. Um, could you know? No one's asking this, but I'm curious. <laughs> Can you substitute sugar and why why honey? Well, I, honey is liquid, right? And so the idea of like a vodka filling is it's a little bit more like you want it to have a specific texture in your mouth. Yeah. And honey is an inverted sugar. It's um, corn syrup is also an inverted sugar. You find corn syrup in, uh, you don't want to use corn syrup. I usually try not to use corn syrup. And so a lot of times when I see a recipe that does use corn syrup, I replace it with honey. Okay. Um, both inverted sugars. And inverted sugar, it is, don't ask me the science because I can't remember right now, but it basically is a liquid at room temperature. Okay. Um, and so honey's a liquid. And so it, it creates more of like a luxurious mouth to feel, if you will, um, than like just regular sugar. So I wouldn't recommend that you substitute sugar, the sugar for the honey. You could use another inverted sugar. You could use corn syrup. Um, and maple syrup is not an inverted sugar, but it does contain liquid. So you almost could get away with using maple syrup if you wanted to. Although I, I, I do like, I do like honey as a flavor component in the babka. And I think part of the reason why I like it is because it's, you know, babka is a Jewish cake. It, it really, it, it comes from Eastern Europe. I think also in Poland, they make babka. So it's really Eastern European. And I like the usage of honey in some of those Eastern European desserts. And okay. I'm gonna quickly, I'm gonna put this in the microwave because it doesn't do anything right now. I'm gonna okay. put it in the microwave for 20 seconds. And at the same time, I'm gonna pull the dough out so we can spread, so I can demonstrate spreading the filling over the dough. And then I'm gonna get your chocolate recommendations and what type of honey you like to use. Okay. Orange blossom or, go ahead though. I. I like almost any, I'm not a big, I don't like strong honey. Chestnut honey was a really, I really had to work to acquire a taste for chestnut honey because it's so strong and I appreciate it. I usually use a mild honey for this um, and chocolate. Well, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big Valrona fan, but I also love other chocolates too. I've been experimenting with other chocolates. I like, I use pretty much all of them. I think guitard, is probably the easiest available in the grocery store right now. I mean, that's what I've been finding when I've been baking at home. Okay. Um, Calibo is another one that's easy to get a hold of. Val Valrona tends to have more cocoa fat in the actual chocolate pieces, in the chocolate itself. And so it has a different mouthfeel than, than something like the, the Calibo. But I, I love them for different reasons. And I do like the extra like cocoa fat in the Valrona chips, which is why I tend to use them more than more than some of the others. But I'm really open. I know that for these, these I usually use uh, like Valrona cocoa powder, but I had gotten a sample of like an artisanal um, cocoa from India and I use them and it's lighter in color. I don't know if you can tell on the screen, but it's lighter in color and it's more like, it's more old timey, old fashioned. And I really like that about about this like more artisanal uh, cocoa powder. Awesome. I'm gonna learn to my microwave. Okay, yeah, do your thing, do your thing. Okay. I'm gonna keep looking at questions over here. Oh my goodness. 
It smells, who has made babka before? Has anyone made babka before? I will ask about the savory and also, you know, does the dough feel like babka? I think that's a great question. So when she comes back, um, ooh, is it possible to ship babka for Xmas? I saw that question as well. Um, who else, who's making, I'm so curious who's making the babka as we go along. I've made babka, but I'm always looking for tips. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm okay. back. So now, now my, this was just 20 seconds in my microwave, but you can see it's sort of, can't, I can't hold the, the, the bowl upside down anymore. And then my, this is cooled down enough. And I'm just gonna um, pull the parchment paper straight off onto my work surface. Um, and then I'm pulling the part of it that was folded up. So and I realize then, I haven't been saying people's names. I'm sorry, Sam from San Francisco is wondering, um, does the dough feel like pie dough? How would you describe the like sort not of- Not like pie dough. It's oh. like brioche dough. Pie dough is stiff. It doesn't have as much moisture in it. And this has a lot of moisture in it. Um, a lot of moisture in it. Um, this is enough. This is 300. You're gonna have to excuse me because I do everything in metric. And I know my book is has the volume and the metric, but this is exactly enough for one babka. So it's about 300 grams. Okay. And I'm gonna start spreading it over the surface of my of my dough. And I wanna work really quickly. And I like to use a really small offset spatula mm -hmm. to just create a nice like even spread. And I this know. is like oh, really wow. liquidy, so. <laughs> It's easy to um, it's like a canvas with your paint. That's so beautiful. It is a little bit, yeah. You do have some people baking along. You have a good morning from Australia, from Marco. You know, um, people were asking. Let's see, Tammy and Betsy uh, were asking about savory babka. Is that a thing? And ah, oh, that's such a good question. I really like that question. So I. In my book, I used this babka dough. Well, originally I used this babka dough to try to make a savory pastry. And I thought that the sugar was too high in it. So mm -hmm. I reduced the sugar by half and I used that and I laminated that. And that became my fantail recipe, which is in my book. So I reduced the sugar by half. And then I basically added some savory ingredients. Like one of them is for with chopped chives um, wow. Wow. and then I laminated it, which I, which means I basically folded it with butter. And then from there I bake, I cut it, I roll it out and cut it into little muffin and put it into little muffin tins and bake it. And then it comes out, it sort of opens up like a fan and I wow. brush it with melted butter. But I like to add when I, once I've reduced the sugar in the recipe, I like to add savory components. I have another recipe for um, cracked black pepper and honey butter as a fantail roll. Oh, I, love <laughs> I know at Sedell's we even tried, uh, we tried truffles and we, you can buy frozen truffle pieces, which is not the whole truffle. So it's a little bit more economic, like in the, in the kitchen, it's more economical if, if, if truffles are economical. Um, and that created a really, really, it was like a luxurious truffle or a luxurious like savory pastry, but you can come up with all sorts of different like add-ins to add to the dough. Um, I love that. Uh, uh, one, let's see. We had Anne from, uh, she's asking if we can pour the chocolate uh, filling all at once. Uh, you can. Just, I usually don't. And yeah. one of the reasons why I don't is it depends on who's doing the spreading and how fast they can spread. And sometimes when the filling is either too warm or too cold, if it's too warm and you're pouring it all on at once, like I'll, I'll add it to the parts that I have a hard time getting to spread out. And so I usually add it in little, in little like drips, actually. Um, sometimes when it's too cold, you do want to sort of drip it, like dot it over your work surface. Um, over your dough so you can reach. I like to, with this babka, I like to reach all of the ends. So I don't leave a, I generally don't leave a perimeter. Like you can see I'm going all the way to the end of right. the dough. 
And the amount of chocolate that you have is for two recipes right now or one? It it's looks one like recipe, it. it's okay. 300 grams. Okay. Um, one, Caitlin was wondering if there's another option instead of the glaze. She was a little concerned it'd be too sweet. Oh, if you use, so I use a lot of milk chocolate. It's not too sweet. Um, I do use a lot of uh, milk chocolate in my recipes. You could use all bittersweet chocolate in the glaze and it won't be sweet at all. It will taste very like, it, well, it, it won't, wouldn't be sweet. Um, or if you wanted to go get away from the chocolate altogether, you could do a traditional crumb topping. Okay. Um, and I don't think I have a crumb topping in my book. I'm trying to think, I think with the apple pie I do, there's a crumb topping. And I know, I know I've used Ina Garten's recipe for crumb topping or Martha Stewart's recipe for crumb topping, but I've tried at Sedell's, we tried using crumb topping and we we're like cutting into the babka and the crumb would fall off. And so we were like, well, why don't we just try a glaze? And I really like the glaze. So right now I'm going to start very gingerly rolling it up from rolling it away from myself. And I try to create a little bit of a fold when I first start and get going. And then just very carefully um, roll it as tight as I can. And yeah, this, this, my this glaze is pretty warm right now. What's your, um, your work, your work um, table? Well, oh my God, why am I saying work table? <laughs> oh, my surface, what is it? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's marble. Ah, okay. I, I, this is an old table I've had for like 20 years and it was originally wood. And I think in my neighborhood, there are all of these little like mom and pop marble shops. And so a few years ago, I just took the measurements of, of the surface. And I think this is like the cheapest marble that I could find, but I wanted to get a marble surface. Um, not necessarily for the temperature. I think I just like the aesthetic look of it better. Okay. Um, but it's helping right now because this is pretty, I don't know if you can see on the video, but this is pretty, for me, it's a little loose and a little warm. And mm -hmm. the flower that I use to keep the parchment from sticking to the babka, I'm brushing it off with a, with a pastry brush. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I was gonna... So it's not getting rolled up into the dough. Okay. Um, Oh, that's about it. And so I have my my have my strip of dough. And I'm just going to take a knife. I'm going to cut it in half. Okay. And I'm going to take the last little bit of chocolate. Okay. So that the dough layers are separated by a chocolate layer. So you just put it. Okay. Got and it. then I do the sort of the same thing where they're touching. I add a little bit of chocolate. And I always think sort of the more chocolate, the better. Yes, I agree. Okay, okay, so I have my my shaped babka. You made that look so effortless. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I have I have my my Pullman loaf pan. You can also bake this in a regular like nine by nine by five like like loaf pan. I've done both. I like the straight edges on the pan. That's why I tend to use a Pullman pan. And then I'm just going to spray it. It's nonstick, but I like to spray it just to ensure. And I feel like the, the, the tricky part is how do you get this into that, right? Because it's really sort of, it's, it's really soft. And so I sort of rock it back and then I rock my hands underneath it. Okay. And then I just sort of like right down in. And so that's the babka. Wow. And then it has to proof. <laughs> And proof means rise, and it needs to rise until it's like twice the size. And I think I wanted to talk about the proofing because the proofing is really tricky at home. Even I have a really hard time proofing any kind of baked good at home. It never proofs the same as at work, and it never sure. bakes the same as at work. And so sometimes I feel like there's this like pressure on a home baker to create these beautiful pastries that look like they came from a bakery. And it's hard if you don't have the right kinds of ovens and equipment. And so at work, we use a proof box. And so proof box creates moisture, creates humidity, and it creates warmth. And that extra warmth and that extra humidity cause the dough to rise quickly. And anytime I've done this at home, it, almost, it takes a long time. Um, I can proof this really like in an hour to an hour and a half at work. Um, oh and 
at home, it takes me like a good two to three hours to get it to proof high enough. And so sometimes I, I, I try, I've tried lots of different things over time. And one of the things that I really like is I'll turn my oven on for like, I'll get, I'll turn it on. I'll wait for the, the burner to turn on. I'll heat it up for maybe like a minute. So there's just enough heat, but it's not hot because yeah. you don't want to like melt anything, but you want that heat. And I'll put a little pan of water in the bottom of my oven and I'll put the loaf in my oven. It's turned off at this point. So there's no heat. So it's not baking. Cake. Yeah. But I just preheated it just ever so slightly. So it's getting that residual heat to help give it that lift and that boost that it needs. And sometimes after like an hour, I'm like, oh, okay, well, now it's cooled down in my oven. What do I do? And I'll, I'll take out, and this is like fastidious me. Like I'll take it out of the oven. I'll turn the oven back on and then back off again, um, just to give it that little bit of extra heat. And you don't have to do that. But I found that like doing little tricks like that just sort of helps speed up the process. Because the worst is like you're waiting for something to proof at home and it just takes forever. And then you're like, oh, well, it must be ready to go. The recipe says three hours and it looks sort of like it's grown enough, but then it doesn't. And I think feel like that's the trick between the babka at a bakery and the babka at home is actually the amount of heat and the proofing that it's getting is quite quite significant compared to what you can get done at home. I, I just had baked some of the, the cinnamon rolls, the cardamom cinnamon rolls, which is another recipe in my book. And I baked them at home on Monday. I had to get them to a journalist and I'm like, I wasn't going into work. I'm like, let me just bake them at home. And I baked them at home and I was like, oh, they're not as good as like, well, what did I do? I didn't prove, even though I thought I proved them enough, it wasn't the same. And also the other difference with baking something in a professional bakery is you're usually using a convection oven and that blast of heat gives a bigger oven spring. So you get more rise out of your product, which creates a different texture. So I always try to like let everybody know, know that because that's a really like important part of like being proud of what you're making at home and feeling successful as a home baker compared to like a baker at like in a bakery that has all of this equipment available to them. Sure. So at this stage, could you, you need to proof it and then freeze it or proof it, bake it and then freeze it? How would you? Yeah, it should, it proofs. So now it proofs. So it should proof for two to three hours. So right now it's a quarter till two. And so it needs to proof for about three hours. So if it's two o'clock, let's say we bake it at five o'clock and then it bakes for about 45 minutes and then it comes out of the oven and then I let it cool down a little bit before I glaze it and then it glazes and then I let the glaze set up. And so if, if you wanted to save it, you can definitely freeze it, but you wanna let it cool down and sort of set up before you like, if you're gonna wrap it in plastic wrap, it should be like already sort of partially frozen before you put the plastic wrap over it. Can you like overproof? is that a thing? Like you proof overnight? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I have. Let me move. I'm going to move this one to the side and I'm going to grab one that I baked yesterday. So I baked this babka yesterday. And here it is. This one, and I, I did overproof them in the professional proof box at work. And what happened was they didn't have any oven spring in the oven. So it didn't like shoot up. It had already gotten as tall as it was going to get in the pan. It literally, the babka right now is like right here. Um, and I had proofed them. They were like all the way up to here, which was pretty significant. I just lost track of time. And when I put them in the oven, there was no like rise. Usually, mm -hmm. usually if you proof them a little bit, then there's a rise in the oven and they're for these, there was no rise, but if you over really overproof them, instead of a rise, they'll sink in the oven. They can't handle the heat. There's no extra, there's no extra left for them to grow from the heat in the oven. And so they would sink, but I think it's a little, I've never had a babka where I overproofed it so significantly that it sunk, but I think that that could potentially be a possibility. Okay. And what do you recommend if you don't have a standing mixer? Uh, making the dough by hand? What is yeah, the best? Yeah, I don't, yeah. I, the way I like to do it is 
you have all of your liquids in your yeast. So I would, I would want to the the kneading and the and the heat from the friction in the mixer causes the instant yeast to dissolve. And so if you're doing it by hand and you don't have that friction, you should warm up your milk just ever so slightly, put the yeast into the milk first. And by warm up, I mean like 95 degrees, no more. Um, put your yeast in, let the yeast sit on the surface of the milk for about five minutes, then whisk it to dissolve it. And it will dissolve into the milk. Then add your eggs and your yolks and whisk those and dissolve those. So now all of your liquid ingredients are homogenous. Then whisk in the salt and whisk in the sugar because those can dissolve in the liquid really easily. And then I think the final thing is the flour. And then that's where you're gonna mix it by hand and really start to knead it in. And then once the dough is kneaded by hand, say like 10 minutes kneading it by hand on your work surface, add the butter and you can sort of like massage, I've massaged the butter in. You can totally do it by hand. You don't necessarily, you don't need a mixer to do it. Okay. Um... And that looks beautiful. Yes, thank you. Um, a couple other questions is, yeah. uh, do you use proofing bags? At work, what I use, I do. I, I usually what I do when I'm proofing it at home is instead of a bag, I'll use a damp, a warm damp cloth and I'll keep it over the surface of the pan because the, the, the dough is not going to reach the surface of the cloth. Um, proofing bags. I like that. I like that a lot. That's a good idea. Um, that traps in the heat and the moisture of the dough and helps it sort of like stay, like stay warm by itself. Um, we do something similar at the bakery and we have a rack with different, like a, a speed rack essentially with a plastic cover that zips up and down. And then what I do at work is I put an induction burner on the very bottom shelf and I put a little pan of water and I turn it on to the very lowest setting to like create that moisture and that humidity. Okay. Uh, we have our first um, substitution question as far as I know. Okay. All. Can you use green flour? So yeah, why not? <laughs> I don't know. There shouldn't be any, there should like, I think all the gluten-free flour, the, the only one that's coming to my head, unless you want to mix it by yourself is cup for cup. And there shouldn't really be any too much of a change. Like all of those flours are made to mimic gluten in mm -hmm. dough. And this, again, this is not a, a super crazy bread dough. This is more like a cake being baked in a pan. So you can definitely use gluten-free flour. Okay. And what about yeast? Are the ratios the same for instant and versus dry active? Yes, yeah, same, same ratios. With active dry, you need to bloom it first. So when I talked about warming up the milk a little bit and dissolving the yeast, that's what you want to do with active dry. Even okay. if you're using a mixer, you still want to do that with the active dry. It has a thicker layer of dead yeast cells on the outside of it. Okay. And then one more question before you go, move on to the next thing. Um, in terms of the loaf pan, you know, you have metal and glass. Is, it, is there a difference? I... I like to think that the heat transfer is better with my my aluminum pan than with a glass pan. But I honestly don't, I like, I don't ever want to say if you don't only have a glass pan, you should go out and buy an aluminum pan. You shouldn't do that. You should use what you have. Okay. And so if you have a glass pan, just remember that the baking time might be a little bit different. And so you're going to want to check it a little bit earlier and see how the, the loaf is doing and maybe either keep it in a little bit longer or keep it in a little bit less time in the oven. What about sourdough starter? That's an interesting question. To make I question. know, I've seen that. I've seen that on Instagram. People are using sourdough starter in their babka dough. I love sourdough starter. I think traditionally it's, is it traditional that it's, I don't know when babka was first created. So I know that that before there was commercial yeast, the only way you could get anything to rise was with um, sourdough starter. And so I would imagine using sourdough starter in this recipe would make for a really wet dough. So I'd probably remove some of the milk if I'm using a sourdough starter. So it doesn't like, it's already pretty wet. I wouldn't want it to be any wetter and try to roll it up. Okay. Um, and so- and I, Oh, sorry, I was gonna say, when somebody uses sourdough starter, how much do you use? And that's where you need to start to, if you're, if you're thinking and considering about 
considering using sourdough starter, you need to look at the baker's percentage, which is basically the ratio of flour to everything else. So if your flour weighs, I think in the recipe, it's at five, 400, 450 grams, mm -hmm. it's about a pound. If you're using the flour, I wouldn't use more than 15% of sourdough starter. So if your flour is 400 grams, you would probably use um, like, I can't do math right now, but you'd use 15, you'd use 15 of the weight of the flour as the amount of sourdough that you want in your recipe. You don't, because there's, and you don't want to just use sourdough. You'd want to use sourdough and yeast in a babka. And so I would use 15%. Okay, that's a fun fact. Um, and so it's proofed. Goes in the proof. oven. Um, once it's proofed, you're gonna brush it with egg wash and you're gonna bake it in your oven that's preheated to 350 degrees for about, I can't remember what the recipe says. I, I usually check it. I'm not, as a baker, I was always taught to, if somebody asks, well, how many minutes does it bake for? The answer is you bake it until it's done because there are all of these other visual signals that say, hey, this is done. Aside from because temperature time really sort of varies, but depending on the oven that you're using. So look for the visual clues that it's done. It should be really golden brown on the top. And then if you sort of slide it, like here's, I slide it out sometimes. I have a hot mitt in my hand and I'll slide it out and then I'll tap it. And, and it should sound hollow. Okay. And that means that either on the side or on the, the bottom, that's how you can tell that it's it's properly baked. And so you bake it and then I usually leave it cool in the pan. I can, I'll leave it cool in this pan for 10 minutes up to like a couple of hours. It doesn't really affect this loaf in particular. Other okay. loaves, yes, and cakes, yes, but not, not this babka loaf. Okay. So then it cools down and then, and then, then I glaze it with a chocolate glaze, which is included in the recipe. Okay. And, um, yeah. I don't know. I, I melted my, my glaze is in pretty good shape. So I basically um, made this glaze early this morning at work. And then I brought it home with me and I just sort of reheated it in my microwave. And okay. it's really, and I have it sitting on a, on a, on a cooling rack over a sheet tray to catch the, um, the glaze. Usually I put down a piece of parchment paper so I can reuse the glaze, but I just basically spoon this, this is the visual part of it. I spoon the glaze over the top of the boss cup. So beautiful. And then I just let it cool down and sort of set up. And if you don't have a rack, what would you recommend to sort of put below just parchment? And is that a quest? I mean, it, yeah, you could totally do that. I think, I think that's what we did for the photo on the cover of the book. I think we didn't even use a rack. Okay. Um, and it sort of oozed off the sides and it was very visual that way. Um, I, I hope that if you're serious about home baking that you would have a cooling rack of some sort, well, that's um, fair. <laughs> but, that's but you don't need to have one to successfully like put the glaze on. And how, okay, so then how long does it take for the glaze to sort of set up? Yeah. Well, I usually cheat a little bit and I'll stick it in my refrigerator. Um, I think it probably takes like, you can slice it at any point. You don't have to wait for the glaze to set up to enjoy it. Um, but I would probably give it about an hour for the glaze to set up. Okay. And what about storage? I think for me, I'm always like, oh, how long, how do I make this last as long as possible? Unless I, like I'm to freeze. I like to freeze things. And so I'll, I usually slice it and then freeze it. So I would slice it. Once the glaze is set up, I would slice it. And then this is a sticky glaze. And so I would probably stick the slices like upright like this into my freezer for 10 minutes to get them to really set up and really be cold. And then I'd wrap it. Either, I'd either put it in a Ziploc bag or wrap it in plastic wrap. Okay. Uh, Linda is wondering if you can please slice one. <laughs> if I can, oh yeah, yeah I can slice, slice one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let me, I'm gonna slice it on the cooling rack, right? 
Um, I liked this question a lot. Besides uh, a visual cue, how can you tell that your dough is proofed and ready? Like, can you press it and it rises? Like, is there, it's the art of, of knowing, I guess, or just practice? I always admit that I always like, if it's like, I, I look for it to look like it's really swollen, which I don't know if that's helpful for somebody at home. Um, but you can definitely press it down and it should hold the indentation. Although with this, this has so much filling in ratio to, it has like 300 grams of filling and 500 grams of dough. So there's almost, almost, but not quite equal amounts of filling to dough. So when you push it, it's not the same as like pushing a, a roll or a loaf of bread where like the, the center should hold the indentation. It's harder to tell that way. But you can you can definitely do that. I, I basically look for it to come up about to really fill out the bottom of the pan, like to fill out the bottom of the pan and to grow by about I'm looking at it right now, maybe about like half an inch to an inch, let's okay. say. OK, um, Marco was like, I'm not sure I would even make it to the fridge. He's like, I'm going to eat it all. Um, one other question. <laughs> Well, one thing is, once you slice it, is it possible for you to bring it closer to the camera so people can kind of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I overproof this by the way. So it looks super, which is maybe a good thing. It looks really fluffy today okay. because I really, I got really busy yesterday. It's not Ooh. a good visual. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's awesome. You have one too, though. I know, I know. It's like, oh. <laughs> I'm going to so I definitely, you know, I definitely cheated on your loaf and I stuck it in the, in the low boy at work for about 20, 30 minutes so that the chocolate, because the chocolate has so much fat in it and it has butter in it. And those are both solids at room temperature. So it will totally set up like as a very solid, like glaze. You just have to give it a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, will, uh, Lisa was wondering if we'll temp a thermometer, sorry, thermometer, I guess, tell you um, the babka's done. Yeah, I love that question. Definitely. I just don't know what the actual temperature, I would guess that it's probably about 200 degrees, maybe a little bit more. And I, I have a recipe in my book for a chocolate chip ricotta cake where I've had a hard time figuring out if it was done or not. And so I was taking the temperature of it and I think it was a little over 200 degrees. So I feel like that would be, without me like Googling it, I feel like that would be about the same for this, about 200 degrees. But I, I don't quote me on that. I'm not, I wouldn't know if that's the actual temperature without having to, like just doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think I just, you know, I have to tell you, once I was teaching a, a babka class for the Bread Bakers Guild, and we were baking all of the babka, and there were so many people in attendance, and we had this old convection oven, and we, we put so many, of the low loaf pans on a sheet tray to fit it in the convection oven that there wasn't any space between the loaf pans. And so I, I'm like, this oven must be right, it's fine. And I, 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 I baked them for 45 minutes and I checked and I'm like, oh, they're golden brown, they're done. I pulled them out and like a little bit later, one of the women in the class, she's like cutting into the middle of hers and it was doughy in the middle and I was mortified. I was like, oh my God, what happened, what happened? I'm like, was it the oven? Like what was going on? And it was that there was no circulation around the pans. And so there wasn't any, there wasn't enough heat reaching the outside of the loaf pan to like properly bake it. And I just didn't know that at the time I was like, oh no, like, can you imagine like teaching the class and then having everybody have raw babka at the end of it? Well, I have a quick story. I once did a flourless chocolate cake and you know, yeah. it's just simple ingredients. And the, there was something with the temperature and the egg. So the egg cooked inside the cake. Oh, it wow. Was like, <laughs> and I was with my friend and we had done a small dinner and we're like, okay, it's just gonna be ice cream for dessert. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh yeah, I know. Like, I mean, that it happens to everybody. It happens to yeah. me. All, all the mistakes that happen every single day of baking. And you just, I guess you just learn as much as you can from, from every mistake, right? Oh, problem solving, right, is a great thing to have. Um, someone did ask, I know you were talking about the different types of um, honey or uh, maple syrup and corn syrup, but is agave an option as well or no? I would say, yeah, if it has the same consistency as honey, I think, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's more about 
it's really about the consistency more than it is about anything else. Okay. Um, I think we'll go through a couple more questions and then I would kind of love to talk a little bit more about your cookbook. Sure, yeah. Um, all right, let's ask a couple more. Um, what temperature would you turn uh, your oven to to proof when you I think I just turn it on to mine turns on automatically at 350 and then you have to adjust it up or down. But I literally don't leave it on for more than like a minute, just okay. enough to get the burner to ignite, ignite a little bit to like penetrate the sides of the oven and then turn it right off again. So it doesn't, you're preheating it, but it's not coming up to temperature. Okay. Um, and let's see. Can you melt the butter before adding it to the dough? That would change it a little bit. And that would create, unless the butter, unless you then cool the butter, like I've made, I've, I think I've had assistants that have microwaved it a little bit too much and there's a little bit of liquid, but then it's soft and that's okay. But if you're gonna add the liquid butter to the dough, it would change the consistency of the dough, but not terribly so. It would might be harder to emulsify it into the dough. I have another recipe in my book for Sufgenia, for Hanukkah, and I, it's a brioche with melted butter. And I like, I like how that sort of creates an even fluffier texture. But in that recipe, I'm adding the butter in additions because it's so liquid. It doesn't just like mix into the dough as easily. It like, it's like separates a little bit. Okay. Um, Jose was wondering if you've ever done the traditional uh, method of cutting each length of the roll and fill dough to expose the layers before braiding them. Yeah, I have, and I've done that. I did that at Per Se, and I thought that that was really pretty. Um, and I think I wanted to do something that reminded me more of the Greens Bakery Bobka in New York, where it's just rolled. And I remember, and this was like seven, like seven years ago, and I remember I was like, I want to know how do I make this like so it, it looks like that cross section. And I watched some YouTube videos of some very like traditional babka shaping techniques to like look at how they were rolling up the dough. And they roll it as one really long loaf and they roll it and then they twist it around itself. Okay. Um, and one more question, let's see for now. So I think I sort of asked this, but I'm not, Sure, I just explained myself very well. So once it's proved not glazed and not baked, you can't freeze it, take it out, bake it, or you can. Like with that. Wanted to freeze it, you would shape it and then immediately freeze it. Okay. And then remove before it. Before it proves all. You okay. shape it right away, then put it in the freezer. And then you have to let it thaw before it starts to proof, and that takes a while. And so I usually then put it in my refrigerator overnight. Amazing. So tell me a little bit more about your book. It's beautiful. Um, I got it a couple of days ago. I mean, how many recipes? Thank you. Are there? How hey, many well, recipes? No, I, are I have. There? No, I had always wanted to write a cookbook, and I, I don't think I. I don't think I realized. I knew it was going to be a big book, but until you actually see the book itself, you don't, you know, it's long. And my, my writer, Carolyn, she's amazing. But when we were getting the, the, the edits back, she's like, I'm writing a second book. And I'm like, it's really, it's 450 pages and it's just me. And I, it took me three, four years to write. And it's truly, I'm very much of a perfectionist, very detail oriented. And I had a lot of information I wanted to share. And so it's all in the book. But I think what was really interesting is that we, like usually you get a galley of the book back, like as your proof copy before it actually goes to print. And this was happening right in March during COVID. And I didn't actually see the book until it was all printed. Like I didn't see how thick it was until they were all printed. Like a month before it was like published or came out, I, didn't, I saw the book for the first time. Like, wow, it's really, it's really pretty, thick book here, but you know, it, it's definitely, it's a work of love for me um, in terms of the amount of time it took me not just to 
to like write the book. But also the amount of time I spent before actually the book. I think I was, I think I wanted to like talk about this a little bit because I know I was talking to a journalist and maybe she was in her 20s and she felt pressure to write a book. And I'm like, sort of joked. I'm like, well, I wanted to write a book in my 20s, but I'm 48. It took me that long until I felt ready. And I said, everybody's on a different timeline for their own lives. And I think you just have to be really true to yourself about like if you're writing a book or whatever you're doing in your career or in your life, you have to be really true to who you are. What is a recipe that's in this book that's been with you for many, many, many years? Like, oh, is there oh, one that's like, oh, this is an OG. Oh, that's hard, right? Uh, I think I, I made the pumpkin cake, the layered pumpkin cake when I was 23 years old. So that's like, what, 25 years ago? Um, that's been with me a long time. Even the sugar cookies, I've had that recipe for a while. And the brownies maybe too. I started making the brownies when I was, it was in the 90s. I used Alice Medrick's uh, classic brownies recipe um, as a basis for my brown. Like I just made her recipe. I was like, well, this is the one. And I never, I, never, I didn't even really change it too much. And I, I remember my, my writer was like, well, you can't put a, a recipe in your book that is somebody else's recipe. But I'm like, but I've been making it for like 25 years. Isn't it my recipe now? Like I, I, I changed the technique a little bit. Um, and so, but I, I, you know, I always believe in crediting everybody who, you know, where everybody gets a recipe from somewhere. And I, I really believe in crediting where the recipe comes from. That's really important to me. Um, do I dare ask you if, if you have a favorite recipe? That's like someone asks your favorite restaurants and I'm like, uh. What is my, what is the question? Or what's one of your favorite recipes or just when you're like uh, a recipe that you love making pretty often? I think it's probably, if I'm doing it at home, it's like one of the easiest recipes, right? It's like brownies. <laughs> like, yeah. or just something straightforward. Like if you're like pressed for time, like just whip up some brownies or I'm thinking like quick breads. I probably made the banana bread pretty often. Ooh, I know I saw that. I was like, oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know, I think I, so many people baked along. I think people should definitely share their food. It's so cool. Oh, that's great. All right, I'm jumping back in, folks. Hi. 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 Doing? Melissa, thank you so much. I mean, that is such a beautiful, I almost, would you, could you hold it up to the camera again? It is so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Yum. So good. That is absolutely gorgeous. Well, I know people still have a million questions. I think, Melissa, maybe in January, we're going to have to do like um, an IG Live or something with you where you can just answer. We'll do it like an AMA and you can just answer yeah. questions all the time. Um, but I want to thank you. Thank everyone who tuned in and amazing questions. Um, I hope we got to, uh, I know we got to a lot of them. Um, Thank you to everyone who's also baking along. We would love to see your boxes. So please click yes. on Instagram and tag Melissa and Carolina so they can see the amazing job you did on your babkas. Um, we got a request to see the cookbook again. Carolina, do you mind holding it up? Here we go. And the babkas on the cover. I think we forgot to point that out. So this gorgeous babka is right there. And then Melissa, we did have one person ask, where could they buy autographed copies? Ah, I signed books at Kitchen Arts and Letters at The Strand, both in New York. Um, I also did book plates for Book Larder um, oh, and also um, uh, now serving in LA. They both, oh, have book, they both have book plates. And Book Larder's in Seattle and all of yes. those books ship. So if you don't live in any of those cities, don't worry, just call them or DM them and they, um, I have no doubt they will ship you one of uh, Melissa's cookbooks. Um, Melissa, congrats on a beautiful book. Uh, your co-author um, is an old friend of mine and Johnny Miller, your photographer is a good friend also. You, oh, awesome. Oh, that's you assembled, wonderful. You assembled a true dream team to put your book together. I did. I did. No, they were amazing. All of them. It's so much, it's so much of a team effort to make a cookbook. It really is. Um, it's really reflective in the book itself. Well, congratulations. Um, Carolina, thank you for asking questions and for uh, you know just being the voice of all of our viewers today. Um, I wanna wish you both a happy holiday and thank you again for doing this.
Um, I want to thank our friends at Carrie Gold. Got to hold up my Carrie Gold. Thank you so much for supporting this demo and for all of our holiday baking extravaganza programming. I know I personally am going through a lot of butter right now. Uh, so I am grateful to have it in my fridge. My cat stopped by to say hi. So dusty. Oh, nice. For all the cat fans. Next year, we're going to have to have some dog content because we I have, have dogs. You do have dogs. You have dogs? You yeah. too, Carolina? I don't have, I did it as a child. Oh, well, Melissa, if we can see, I'll uh, talk us out as you go find uh, your pup. Um, but thank you again. Oh, who do we have here? This is George. George. Hi, George. Oh what kind of uh, dog is George? Oh my gosh. He's a pug. He's a pug. Oh, so oh my gosh. George is so cute. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we need to figure out something to do with Melissa and George. So stay tuned. We'll come up with a great idea, everybody. All right. Well, happy holidays, everyone. Thank you for joining Thank our you. holiday. Thanks, Thank you, Carrie.